of it. Uh, just briefly, uh, the Society for Music, Cognition, and Perception has a meeting every year like any professional society, society of biologists, society of music theory, uh, carpenters, plumbers, everybody has an annual meeting. Uh, and in 1997, the meeting was held at MIT, and Barry Verko, who was the host, uh, arranged for Steven Pinker to give the keynote address. Pinker uh, was known then as an eminent cognitive psychologist of language. He hadn't yet published any of his fabulous uh, popularizations of cognitive uh, psychology and cognitive science. Excellent books, I recommend them. Uh, but at that point, uh, you know, he, he had finished the writing of the first of them, The Language in Sacred, and he had been published. And we were all eagerly anticipating what he might have to say. And we met in um, uh, Cresby Auditorium at MIT, a room about the size of Finkelspiel. And uh, there were 200 of us in the audience. Pinker took the stage to great applause. And the first words that came out of his mouth were, I don't know what it is that any of you do, really, and I've never read any of your papers, but here's what I think is wrong with your entire field. <laughs> uh, he said, you're studying something that isn't worth studying. Why would you want to study music? Everybody knows it's auditory cheesecake. And what he meant by that, um, the auditory cheesecake remark uh, relates to a rhetorical challenge that people have leveled against evolutionary theory, uh, which is, in, in one form or another, it goes like this. If evolution is so smart, and they always contextualize it this way, as though evolution has motives and will, uh, but they, you know, as a way to sort of, uh, these are people who are, tend to be non-scientists to begin with, uh, and so uh, to sort of you know, trivialize the claims of Darwinian um, evolution, they say, if evolution is so smart, uh, why is it that we like cheesecake? Everybody knows that cheesecake is harmful, it's damaging, you eat too much, it can lead to obesity and diabetes and all kinds of health problems and clogged arteries and you know, if evolution is so smart, we wouldn't have adapted uh, a taste for it. And the argument is that, well, we didn't uh, in the, really. With cheesecake here is a stand-in for facts and sweets. And the, uh, the argument goes that in the kinds of quantities fats and sweets were available to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, it would have been a good adaptive strategy to load up on them because they weren't plentiful. You couldn't make yourself sick on them. Uh, if you found a source of fats and sweets, uh, it, was, it was beneficial to take whatever you got, because it might be a long time coming before you get it again. And to sort of paraphrase Robert Sapolsky, we're running around with bodies and minds that were adapted to conditions the way they were thousands or tens of thousands of years ago in some cases. Our, our brains and our biology hasn't caught up with the fact that you can go <coughs> through your pantry and open it up and just gorge yourself silly on Twinkies. So, uh, the idea is that uh, cheesecake sort of tricks systems that had a real evolutionary basis. It tickles certain sensors that had some uh, importance and advantage uh, for the organism the way conditions used to be. In the same way that heroin tickles certain uh, gratification centers, although no one would argue that a taste for heroin is adaptive. Uh, as here on this pointed out, heroin taking parents make actually pretty bad parents. They neglect their children and you might expect that, you know, given enough time, uh, a taste for heroin is going to weed itself out uh, through natural selection, uh, re weed itself out of the population. Now, what Pinker was implying by talking about music as auditory cheesecake is that it's a byproduct of the adaptation for language and one that, you know, might make you sick, actually, if you have too much of it. And the consequence of Pinker's uh, statement in 1997, apart from the fact that uh, the very mild-mannered and meek Stanford graduate Carol Crumhansel, known to you music cognition folks, of course, as the parent of the Crumhansel, Kessler, and Crumhansel and Shepard tonal profile work, uh, basically showing that even uh, non-musicians have an exquisite sensitivity to tonal structure and to the uh, hierarchy of tones in music theory. They can sort of replicate Western music theory just by their intuitions about what notes should follow, what other notes. Uh, Crumhansel, who's a very docile person normally, almost punched out Pinker after this. Uh, I mean, she was shaking and red in the face, and her fists were clenched, and she was white knuckled, and she was furious. 
uh, Ian Cross and David Huron, who were uh, in attendance, uh, both musicologists, uh, began, took this as a challenge to sort of explore something that had not been adequately explored since the origin of species, since Darwin. It had sort of fallen into disfavor to ask about music's origins. And really what Pinkery launched in 1997 was a concerted effort by Huron and, uh, and Cross and Jonathan and others to try and figure out why music, where does music come from? Not necessarily the question of did music precede language, which was really the gauntlet that Pinker was throwing down, but I think the more interesting question of why do we have music at all and where did it come from? What are its origins? And what sources of information can we draw on to address the question in as scientifically rigorous a fashion as possible? Uh, a number of sources are available. Thanks to intrepid musicologists, ethnomusicologists, we now have recordings, field recordings, uh, from cultures who have been cut off from Western influence uh, for hundreds of thousands and thousands of years. Uh, people from the Sub-Saharan Africa, from the Amazon rainforests, from Bali, from the Ural Mountains. Uh, people who are preliterate, still hunter-gatherer, subsistence lifestyle uh, people, and who by their own accounts have been making music the same way on primitive hand-built instruments, you know, as far back as anybody can remember. Oh, this is the instrument my grandfather's grandfather's grandfather used, or it's one modeled after it. And these are the songs that we sung about the origin of the world and things like this. So we have some sort of anthropological evidence about what music might have been like. We have uh, some evidence from neuroscience, both from endocasts, archaeological findings of impressions, made on skulls uh, about the brain regions that were present in um, ancient humans, ancient hominins, Neanderthals, Australopithecines, and so on. We have comparative studies. We can look at what bonobos and chimps and uh, macaques and vervet monkeys and other whales, uh, the, the vocalizations of animals that, well, birds, the vocalizations of other species that sound to us like music, and we can ask whether they are or are not music and what patterns they have, uh, whether they exhibit recursion, generativity, repeatability, transposition. Uh, and we have evidence from neuroscience. Um, we know that the brain evolved uh, in layers, uh, building out from a core, a reptilian, if you will, core. And that um, newer and newer brain structures evolved uh, on the outside of this, this core, and we can look at neuroimaging studies of music versus language, and we can make inferences about which regions are phylogenetically, we have some feeling about which regions are phylogenetically older. Music tends to activate the phylogenetically older regions, so we can not conclude, but we can suppose that maybe music is older than language. So there are a number of sources. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things, uh, of course, are these archaeological findings like the Slovenian bone flute and other bone flutes. Um, it's been noted by several archaeologists that in human burial sites and Neanderthal burial sites, some of the oldest artifacts we found are musical instruments. They're not jewelry or water drums or tools, they're musical instruments. And by and large, within a given time period, the most technologically sophisticated artifacts are the musical instruments, with precise spacing of the poles, with precise contours. Among things that have been found, Jonathan mentioned the bone flute being controversial. There are other controversial things that have been found. Shells that uh, we believe were used uh, to clap together in much the way that we would make castanets today. Uh, one of the oldest claimed musical instruments is the bullhorn. This is a, a shell or a piece of wood that's hollowed out such, in such a way that if you swing it on some kind of a cord, it'll make a whistling sound. It sounds something like and these appear to be very old. We can't know for sure that they were used this way, but we find things that are perfectly consistent with, with modern-day, latter-day Latin musical instruments like castanets and claves and, and bullhorns. So we believe, somewhat controversially, that these old shells and wooden things we found uh, that are dated from even 60,000 years ago were used as musical instruments. 